edition of the Mindset Game Podcast, and I'm your host, James Roberts. Before we get started with this week's show, first off, let me take this opportunity to welcome back the regular listeners, and if this is your first time listening to the show, I hope you enjoy this episode and decide to subscribe to the show. And today's guest, I've got Mark Stutel. He's the first team coach of Northumbria University men's basketball team, uh, better known as Team Northumbria. So thanks again, Mark, for coming on the show. No problem. Thanks for having me. So we talked briefly a little bit uh, how you got into basketball. Can you explain to the listeners uh, what what were the initial steps from for you getting into becoming a coach? Yeah, um, I guess coaching was all, you know, I kind of played the game from about the age of uh, 14. Um, and, that, you know, I guess I'd always loved kind of whatever club I was at, kind of working with the younger kids and, you know, just, I guess at the time I thought it was coaching, probably it was just more kind of facilitation and, you know, I guess, lack of a better term, you know, babysitting, entertainment, that type of stuff. But I was lucky where one of my first coaches uh, was a coach, Jimmy McGinn. He um he always got me got me involved in kind of like summer camps and half term camps. So I was I was always playing on whether it was the under sixteens uh, or under eighteens team at the time. He always used to get me involved in that, and it was something that I just I really enjoyed. You know, people say that, but I just I just love the interaction and you know particularly with with kind of working with you know uh, under tens and so on and so. On. I just really enjoyed it. Um, so as a as a as I played. Uh, you know, I moved around a few different places, um, and you know, I think I'd obviously settled up in up in uh, the Newcastle area, and uh, I was playing for Team Northumbria at the time, and uh, the, the 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 coach of the program uh, had left just before the end of the season, um, and the our program is actually ran and delivered and managed by uh, the Newcastle Eagles, so via service level agreement so the Newcastle Eagles actually oversee and they run and deliver all of Northumbria men's and women's and they they just you know they kind of asked me as somebody who was I, I was coaching uh, the college academy team at the time and and they just you know I was I guess I was kind of the captain of the team and uh, and we were you know literally at the back end of the season they'd asked me if I could just kind of step into the end of the season and then it would get reviewed uh, to which I did and we had a we had a couple of tough games you know trying to Trying to play in coach is just for me. For, for me, it was impossible personally. And then uh, in the summer, you know, I was offered the, the full time position uh, with Northumbria, which it, it just kind of aided a lot of the other stuff that I was doing. Like I say, the, the college academy stuff, and I was quite active in the region for kind of junior development, um, you know, regional teams and area performance centres, as it used to be known. Um, so I felt like it aided all that stuff, and it was the next step for me. Um, and, and then since then, I've just kind of yeah, I've kind of stuck with it. So that was my first year, which was 2011, 2012, um, in terms of with Northumbria, and I just kind of moved on from there. And in terms of player development and for the kids in the local area that you you've probably seen develop, is there a pathway for them to go on in terms of uh, getting through the colleges? And looking at possibly going to Northumbria University and staying in that pathway, obviously from college level, looking at if the person had aspirations to possibly get to play for the Eagles down the lot down the line, is there something of that nature in place? Yes, yeah, there is. Um, I think our pathway is something that's um, you know something that we're proud of from from kind of top of the club to. to to the younger age groups um you know there's been a lot of people that have probably been instrumental in in, in kind of developing that pathway um it, i think it's always it, it's such a relevant kind of question james and it's such it, you know you probably open up a whole a whole other issue which is good um because of um the players that have that have been around at that pathway and and how long they've been um how long they've been playing at a certain age group is it the right thing for a player to step up is it the right thing for a player to step down um and, and you know when you look at uh, there's a guy from you know kind of sports coach uk um stuart armstrong who talks a lot about talent and 
and I went to a clinic a few, a few years back and he was talking about uh, like the iceberg model and what people see at the top, mm -hmm. you know, above water and obviously a lot of the, you know, the other factors that are underneath it and, uh, you know, social factors, family influence, mental capacity, physiological, you know, all, the, all these other type of things that kind of make up an athlete to progress through to the highest level and with ourselves the highest level is the Eagles so in my experience I've been with the club because um, I actually started off with the club as a, as, a, as a kind of a foundation coach a community coach uh, in 2000 and I want to say seven <laughs> my memory served me right I think about 2007 um, so you know I, I'm getting on to nearly 10 years kind of, 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 of play full-time employment with the club um, so I've seen a lot of players who have um, progressed through now whether players have actually went through and made a full time you know kind of an impact that we all would have liked at the BBL level is another question uh, you know because we've had junior guys that maybe step up to the to the BBL team at the age of 18, 19 and I guess the question is whether are those guys are they ready to play and, and what happens to them at, at that stage and, and then the balance of minutes in the BBL versus minutes of stepping down uh, at the time it was Division 2. Now it's obviously Division 1. Um, the governing body, Basketball England, influenced that. So even from last year to this year, they've reduced the age from under 25 uh, with British player movement to under 23 with British player movement. Uh, so that's a decision that they've, they've, they've made. Um, so we do we have the pathway you know we have structure from a player can start playing basketball through our hoops health program but under 10s they can progress through uh, to go to one of our satellite clubs which are based all around the Tyne and Weir area and there's a lot of successful clubs there with the participation they can then progress on to our national league structure which we call the school of excellence um, both male and female and then the idea is as they're progressing up to under 18 school of excellence they would go to one of our partner colleges to one of where where we're delivering um, uh, kind of academy level basketball, and then hopefully get the the entry requirements to progress onto the university. Uh, it's not something that we've got a hundred percent, you know, right. It's not because you know one of my biggest things is I have to to be competitive in in the uh, the university league and in Division One. I have to recruit nationally and sometimes internationally. Um, where it would be fantastic if the majority of the team was made up of. Of, of local players um, so I think that is the dream and hopefully we, you know we've got to keep working to get there but uh, in terms of the structure itself being there do uh, you know it, it's there and then we've just got to keep reviewing it and, and, and tweaking it and working on it short term medium term long term you know but like you say in terms of player recruitment it's at the, the end of the day division one and obviously what is it pr uh, premier in terms of university isn't yeah it? we're in the books premier yeah it would be a case of your job at the end of the day is to get results. So mm -hmm. you you need to obviously get the best players you can to to keep yourself in in that position. Yeah, nail on the head. <laughs> you know, nail on the head, mate. Where, and this is where I, I kind of I love the level that I coach at because it, it's it's a development slash results business. You know, it is. And and you know, somebody asked me a kind of few years back. Uh, about you know what what are our goals at Northumbria and essentially there's, there's two to compete at the highest level we can in every competition um, with a particular focus on the university side because the university is massive in uh, funding our program running our program administering our program and um, and they, you know the they, the university are very vocal on how they want to be uh, judged in university sports so this past year we finished eighth with all sports, mm -hmm. but in terms of uh, books, points, we actually finished first in the country you know, across our three men's teams and our two women's teams. We actually had more books, points than any other universities. Um, so so that, that they're really pleased with that, but I think, as you say, um, the university are big on student experience. They're big on you know making sure that these athletes come in and have the, the best possible chance to be successful, but ultimately, <laughs> we're, we're judged on results. Um and, and I guess with the like the cyclical nature of university sports, um, out of all the years you know I've, I've been here, I've, I've only really had kind of one really challenging year in terms of results. Um, and you know the university and the club kind of stuck with me, and um, you know which was reassuring because it, it was a challenging year. And obviously you start 
asking yourself questions at the back of your head about you know where the um, you know what what happened and, and, and at our level it can be such fine margins you know it really can it can be player recruitment as much as you get to know somebody throughout the recruitment process and you work with them until they get here and you're three four weeks in and you're battling and competing and you're trying to test them and challenge them you know you, you really don't get to know somebody until you go through the course of a season mm. um, so I mean yes it's it's recruitment is is, is a massive part of the job um, and, and making sure that you get kind of good people who are able to to buy into the system and when I say the system I don't mean what offense we're running or what defense we're running I mean I mean the you know the environment and the culture of the club and the approach to training and the you know getting the processes right and all those types of things and that's where that's where recruitment becomes becomes key. Um, so I'm very lucky when I when I have a recruiting class that maybe has three or four core guys in it that are able to to stay the course and move on and 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 then it becomes a really player led culture. You know, my first couple of years, I wanted to. Um, I don't know, for lack of a better term, I wanted, you know, I tried to create the most challenging environment we could have, and I was very kind of confrontational with a lot of players. Um, you, you know, simply in a basketball kind of challenging them sense, um, you know, and nothing that was other than, you know, what I thought was the right thing to do at the time based on my experience. And you know, I, I think we st we still have that. We still hold each other accountable. But I have, I'm lucky where even this current season, um, I've got a lot of guys that have known me a long time, been with me a long time and and are able to make it a player led culture. Um so that's that's really positive from my standpoint. And then there's the the question like I, I think I, I brought off brought up off air a little bit, obviously with the you say with player uh recruitment. Mm -hmm. What do you have to kind of put in place a plan of say over that three-year cycle, in terms of what what you want to put in place, because obviously for the listeners that that aren't from the UK, obviously you, we've only got, well, depending on the course, generally most students are at university for three years, whereas that's not the case in say the US, where they well in theory that they're going to be there for four years, mm -hmm. uh, be that the exception of the one the one and dones mm -hmm. who are looking to progress. Obviously, to the NBA, but yeah, yeah. to come back to that point, obviously, to look at more, more, more at the UK in depth to that question, do you kind of have to put a strategy in place and looking at uh, macro cycling in terms of uh, doing a plan for three years and then breaking it down from there? Yes, yeah, essentially. Um... But we, you know, we we plan every year, um, year by year. Uh, but then you look at kind of your long term recruits with that as well, you know, and people who are, you know, you you know that people are two three years away, and you try and build that relationship with those, you know, with those athletes two three years away. I mean, I mean, the, you know, you mentioned the states there, James, and it, it it's it's so relevant in 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 our game. Uh, the reality is, any British kid who is uh, sixteen seventeen years old. And is six five, six six, six seven plus, who uh, the majority of people are competing for. The reality is, if, if they're at national team level or they're at top twenty five in the country level, the majority of them are looking to go abroad. You know, with the states being the number one destination, and over the past few years, there's been you know a trend with people going to to Europe as well. Um, we're talking about you know the, the top, the top. 25 I would say but definitely the top 12 particularly in that category of you know that height it, it's it's extremely difficult to try and keep um, British guys uh, in the country now I'm not a coach who says like you have to come to us because it's the only option because for the, for, for some people it is the right thing to go to the states not for everybody and, and there's this stigma that that Every British kid needs to go to the states to to develop, and I think a lot of the a lot of the kids get um, blinded by the lights, if you like, where they they see, um, you know, the US. It's it's the best. It's this and it's that. And a lot of pe a lot of the, the the athletes that go out there don't really do their due diligence, you know, in terms of looking at the the program, the coach, 
the philosophy, the system, the town, the you know all these factors that can lead into whether an athlete's going to be successful out there. And I, I guess the education of this has got better. You know, maybe over the past five years it has got better, but there's still this stigma of you know I'm going to go to the states first, and then I'll look at British universities second. And the amount of athletes that contact me around June, July, August, and they're trying to get a September start where. You know, obviously the UCAS process, mm. January the 15th is, is, is kind of our entry deadline for undergrads. And then you go through to the clearing, whereas for postgraduate, a little bit more flexibility. But it, it, honestly, it's amazing. They get set on, I'm going to go to the States. And if it's the right thing, and there have been some examples of, of where it has been the right thing for British guys to go to the States, um, I would say that I think that there's more stories in my experience of where it hasn't been the right thing, where people have went there with aspirations to go and play high levels in Europe, and they've literally, because of one reason or another, they've, they've completed three, four years in the States, but then they've come back and they've played, you know, Division 2, England, Division 1. They might have sat on the bench for a BBL team. And I guess the argument would be, you know, is that the quality of the player? Is it the quality of the coaching? Is it the quality of the leagues? And there's all these other things, but... I really, really think that there are certain institutions in the UK, basketball-wise uh, and academically, that, that are strong and can offer a solid alternative to the States. Um, and it has to be looked on individual case-by-case -case basis. But it, it's, it's, you know, it's something that I'm obviously kind of, the last few years I've been you know, working with. And it, listen, I've had, you know, I mentioned to you before, the academy, I've had players uh, that I've facilitated, you know, to go to the States because it's been the right thing for them. And as much as, you know, you're a coach and you work with somebody and, and you would like to see that journey all the way through, they've done two, three years with ourselves at our academy and it was the right thing for that individual to go to the States and we've supported and facilitated that. And I'm not saying it, it's not, I'm just, it's not the one model fits all. And I think mm -hmm. that, that's one of the biggest kind of, misconceptions out there for, for young people who think, I want to go and play basketball, I want to combine it with my studies, I have to go to the States. It, it's a business, you know, there's coaches out there that are, I read I read something not too long back about the average um, number of jobs that a head coach will have in the state is they have, they have to be prepared to move seven times to be able to get a long-term head coaching position, and that could be going from North Dakota to Tennessee, up to California, over to Ohio, you know, like literally they're moving cross country. So, you know, because of it is a business out there, a coach goes in, they recruit a British kid. He has a, a, a season that where they're below 500 in terms of games and there he's out the door and somebody else is in and you, you don't fit my philosophy, you don't fit my system, I'm going to bring my new players in. It, there's just, you know, that's one example of however many there can be. Um, now, you know, listen, the top, top level that are going to big schools, ACC schools, uh, Pac-10 school, all those type of stuff, no, no problem. Big East schools, you know, that's best to look to you. People that are going there on, a uh, former player of mine went to uh, Rice University, mm -hmm. uh, which regarded as, as, as probably the number one engineering university in the world. So he, you know, he for his, for his later life, he's going to be set up. You know, he, he would probably, I don't want to talk on his behalf, but he would probably tell you that basketball-wise, he, he would reflect on that decision, I think. I mean, it's it's been great for his life, but somebody who was extremely kind of talented, uh, he would look at that again and basketball-wise and say, was it the best thing from a strictly basketball standpoint? And we don't know. He's going to be set up for life because of the quality of his mm -hmm. degree, which is which is a, the other the other arguments of it. But it's just I just think it's it's a, it's a it's a relevant question that I don't think we get right as a generally as a country. Uh, there's certain places that do. I mean, Barking Abbey. Barking Abbey is the the regional institute, and uh, you know, in particular, Lloyd Gardner and, and James Veer, who are down there. I, I I think they do. I think that you know they're, they're they're telling the kids the right messages. They're telling them how competitive it is. They're exposing them to that level by bringing coaches over and actually taking teams over to the US. Um, and they've got a track record of development and what's best for the individual. And they've also been proactive in signposting some of their kids to British institutions as well. Cause, so, and, and this is something that I've always looked at if any, in Northumbria. Realistically, for anybody of size, so like I say, 6'4", 6'5", 6'6", plus, 
I'm really kind of competing for second tier kids, if that makes like, you, and that's not a knock on them. It's because the first level are I'm going to states and I'm set and I'm you know that's it. So it's just you know it's just about kind of looking at that and then making sure that and what would have to happen to break that cycle. We would have to start showing and you know proving that people can go to a British institution, they can develop just as effectively or if not more so effectively and that they can then um, uh, move on and, and make a living out of the game just as somebody from the States could or if not better. So it's that, you know, until that starts becoming a consistent message and a consistent, uh, like, you know, there's, there's evidence there that, that that can happen, I guess, you know, that there's some of the battles that we're going to face. But in terms of one thing you probably didn't touch upon there is in terms of, if we look at it solely at university level, uh, in terms of funding, you're already on the back foot in terms of uh, how much money the institution gives to the sport from that sense. So yeah. it's, it's it's something that British, British, British universities have obviously brought about, or well, I think it was, in terms of my university, for just argument's sake, I think they brought it in like scholarship type type things. Or when was I at university? It would have been about two thousand five that, that I saw, first saw things like that. But then in terms of scholarship, I thought well, a thousand pounds is nice. But in terms of what an American university can offer you is obviously. If it's say for D Division One, for argument's sake, if you're good enough, you're going to get a full ride. And mm -hmm. it's one thing talking to Alex Wumi on a previous podcast. It's saying he was saying oh, it's all it's all well and good. Kids thinking, oh, okay, I don't have to pay to go to school, but at the end of the day, it's probably something. Even even in this country, they probably may not think of it as. Oh, well, I'm going to get a full ride. All I have to worry about is the sport. Well, it doesn't work that way in the US. Obviously, there's. Um, I don't know if it's the same in the UK in terms of uh, uh, eligibility, but obviously in the US, you need to keep at a certain grade point average to be able to play. Yeah. And at yeah. the end of the day, it might it might be termed as um, you're going as an athlete, but. Technically, you, you are still student athlete, and the first word in that sentence is the student. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I get another you know another relevant point, mate, on, on two fronts. I guess I'll touch on the on the first one, um, and the latter point first about you know the GPA and the, and again, it's not, you know, I don't want to you know sit here and and look like it's it's kind of I'm bad mouth in the state. I, I'm not. You know, I, I I support what's best for an individual. There have been numerous stories, you know, of individuals where the states hasn't been the right option, and and again, you know, that stuff I said before about blinded. Now, looking at the GPA, I guess that's again, it's good. And I, I, I mean, when I was playing, you know, I, I played in a uh, in a high school in Ohio for a year, um, so I kind of had some experience of of being out there and actually going through the process of being recruited for colleges as well um as, as as a student athlete and and everyone's talking about the gpa stuff and you know i was a capable student i wasn't the best student i wasn't the worst i was you know i was a capable student um gpas you, you'll see where if if we're investing forty thousand dollars into you you have to maintain your gpa of course you do what happens to the athletes there who are looked as as athletes first and students second well what happens is for lack of a better term they'll get spoon fed you know, they will get spoon fed by enough people there to, to maintain that GPA, you know, and, and they'll have support workers, mentors, blah, 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 that will, you know, that will, that will make, and it's a good thing because ultimately the athlete's coming out of it with a degree, but is that setting them up for later life, post basketball, world of work, you know, managing deadlines or, you know, all those types of things that are important. And again, that's not everybody, but I, I, I do know that that happens, um, on the other side of it, the GPA is there. It's good if people are disciplined and they're able to work with it. You know that that's that that'll work also. Uh, I've actually, you know, when I was coaching the academy and I was having, I had some guys who were A level students, some guys who were B tech students. I had some guys that missed some deadlines consistently, and I, and I just pulled them from the program. So although there's not a national thing over here, it's something I've done to try and help them mm -hmm. with with like life lessons. 
the finance one is it's again it's it's a it's a, it's a really good point you know um, athletes can go to the states and get scholarships of thirty five forty thousand pound tuition accommodation food etc blah 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 and and, that, and you know that's them set and they're coming out with with a good degree and, and, and no debt athletes over here like you say you know you mentioned a thousand pound figure there's a, there's a misconception that particularly at Northumbria you know we're we're people that the amount of people that contact me and ask for a free ride and a full scholarship so you know I go back to them and say you know what is your what is your interpretation of a, of a, of a full scholarship and they're saying you know cover my tuition fees that's nine thousand pound <laughs> the university is not going to do it no no it, you know it just it doesn't it doesn't happen but because again we have a good program that's linked in with um you know the most successful professional club we play at a 30 million pound sports center um we have a very professional program that i'm proud of um but we're still not able to offer you know multiple guys um and, and that point that you said before this is so relevant i it's a very fine line between investing somebody who's going to come in and develop and know that maybe by their third year they're going to be a key player but i've still got to be able to win in year one and year two <laughs> of that player's cycle so and that's where the that's where the balancing act comes where you know if i can get players who are able, who can come in and make an impact straight away fantastic but then i've got to look at guys and say well the reality of the majority of people who come in and make an impact are probably not going to be undergraduates because if they were they'd be in the states or they'd be elsewhere um and then i mean the finance thing this is where people you know, and, and I understand it as well. When I was uh, when I was at university, um, I was on the TAS scheme. You mm -hmm. know, the, the, yeah, I'm sure you know, like, Jim, yeah. but you know, the Talents Athlete Support Scheme. And I was it was when basketball was put on it for the first time. Um, so I received, I think it was maybe, I think I received two five hundred pound payments from from TAS itself. But it was about the support services. It was about the strength and conditioning. Mm -hmm. It was about the nutrition advice, the, the access to a sports psychology, paying for more court time. All these things that Northumbria actually does. And this is where people have to look at it and say, "I want to go and develop. I'm going to go to Northumbria because I get access to thirty million pound facilities. We have our strength and conditioning suite is, you know, world class. Um, the the we we do have we have a sports psychologist we have a sports nutritionist we have performance analysis we have physio you know we have all these things that are really important you know that we class as support services on top of your coaching and on top of you know the other type of stuff so that's where that coupled with some of our players that do get some support you know and and some of our players will receive um, a little bit of financial support and we're not talking kind of. Um, you know, life-changing figures, but we're talking figures that might mean the difference between them having to get a part-time job and them not, for example. Um, and and that, again, because of the schedule, you know, they're at uni, let's say, 12 hours a week, maybe, if that's, you know, roughly around there. And then their basketball commitments could be up to, you know, 20 to 25 hours a week when you take into account individual workouts, team meetings, scouting sessions, video sessions, strength and conditioning, massage team training games travel you know all that type of stuff you add it up it becomes like a full-time job you know it does it becomes you know 37 hours a week with the studying and stuff so we want to look after our athletes as best as we can and it's that fine balance of saying this is the, the scholarship pot that we've been allocated how can we uh best use it to be successful now because success breeds success and then more people want to come and and that's a good thing for us. We want to be more competitive, but we also want to offer opportunities to British guys. I mean, last year, uh, my team had uh, we finished. I think I think we finished fifth in the league. We made two semi-finals in Division One, um, and we got through to the Bucks final. Now, in the National League, we were all British. You know, we, we, that was something I was extremely proud of. We had twelve British guys. Everybody was on the age of twenty-five, apart from my captain who uh, played with us previously, went away and then came back. He was the only one over the age of 25. And we were competing in, in Division 1 where, you know, teams are bringing in Americans, Spaniards, you know, foreign players. So this year, uh, out of my, I have 12 players registered in the National League. I have one US player, uh, 11 British guys. And again, one of those British guys is over the age of 25 and everybody else is under um, the age of 25. So it's, it, you know, we're trying to, get that model correct and we're trying to make sure that 
that British guys have an opportunity to play whilst being successful now and and if that balance it is. But I mean the things that you said on there, you know, the financial impact of an individual saying, I'm gonna go and take out student finance for, for nine thousand um, pound, it's it's something that we have to deal with. Yeah. And in terms of what's one I didn't bring up is obviously college sport is obviously a business as well in itself. Yeah. Because obviously they've got or be it basketball, American football, uh, be it one of the other other sports uh, that's shown on national television, either regionally or in most cases with basketball and American football, it be nationally. So the institution is obviously making money from the uh, networks for broadcasting that, whereas in the UK, or. Well, I don't see that ever happening in the, in the, in the near future in terms of, uh, say, for example, the BBC getting behind it and showing live coverage of sport on, say, a weekend, for example, because it hasn't got that traditional element of it being part and parcel of uh, society and then obviously... Uh, if we come back to it and look at the obviously the American psyche of it, it is in their DNA of uh, high school sports being on a Friday night, the college sports being on a Saturday, and the professional sports on a Sunday. And obviously, mm -hmm. that is the progression route. If somebody wants to succeed in, say, basketball or American football, that's the route they well they want to aspire to. As I want to go from playing on a Friday to mm -hmm. playing on a Sunday. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we've got a, you know, I think you said their media presence at all levels, you know, and it's going to start with our our professional league, you know, it's going to start with the, the BBL in terms of their media presence and that growing interest in the game and then hopefully filter down. I mean, uh, books, they, they, do a, they do a good job of kind of promoting the sport, I think. Um, I think they made a terrible decision maybe 45 years ago for basketball in particular, um, where the final eights competition was was a premier competition in, in, in the British basketball calendar. Um, so it was it was always at Sheffield at the the EIS in mm -hmm. Sheffield, and it was a Friday, Saturday, Sunday competition. So you start with eight teams on the Friday, and by the Sunday you had your winner, your runner up, your third foot, all the way through to eight. And it was you know the top top four teams in the north, top four teams in the south. Um, go through into playoffs and then, you know, so be it, we get the winner and uh, books a few years back uh, against the advice of the uh, basketball advisory group oh. uh, decided to then keep it as the final eight competition or super eight or elite eight, whatever they term it, and just play the quarterfinal and the semifinal and then you play the final on what they call books Big Wednesday where they have all of the finals together in every sport at a certain venue on one day, um, and this is—I think this has been the third year of Bucks Big Wednesday now, uh, and I don't think it's atrocious. Honestly, I do. I just um, talking with you know, like like uh, Sam Nita at Hoops Fix and and different different people. The final eight was on. It was a highlight of the basketball calendar, um, and as much as kind of the BBL playoff final is, and, and you know, I think this past year, off the top of my head, I think. How many people did they? Ten thousand, eleven thousand people there, I think, roughly at the. Like they were too, you know. So when when these events are promoted and marketed correctly, you know, you can get uh, great coverage. Uh, and it was great that this year both the men's and the women's final was was on the BBC, albeit through the red button. But it was, you know, it was on it was on the BBC. So you can do that. And again, for just bringing it back into like our personal one about university basketball. The final eight, the coverage for that was good. You know, there was even times when the games would get live streamed. You would have eight men's teams, eight female teams there. By default, you know, they're bringing their own support mm -hmm. and all this type of stuff. And the, the, it was just, for me, it was a premier competition in the country on the basketball calendar. And Bucks just decided to, to go away from it. And I think it's been a poor decision. Um, and that's something that... Um, I guess it's my thoughts on it. But you're right, James, nail on the head. Media... Um, media presence, media coverage, and, and the reality is, it's never going to be the level where it is in the states because of, I guess their, you know, their approach to sports, 
from high school level uh, all the way through and it's it's they have a different approach you know you mentioned the friday night sports the high school that's something that again i, I was lucky to have experience with and it shuts the town down you know it, it, it and it has such a wider impact on the community this is you know your stature in society can be based on whether your son or daughter is playing varsity sports it's it's it, you know it is it's, it's really embedded within their culture um where you know we're we our main sport is with football you know and it will be sunday league football and you know people who get involved in it and so on so we're always going to be fighting that battle but hopefully if, if we're able to get you know better homegrown players coming through and 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 increasing the impact of the top league hopefully that would impact it i mean you know, that's something that, that the i know the bbl have always looked at in terms of their strategy but you know the um it, it's an interesting debate is maybe the amount of import players in our top league and the amount of opportunity um in our top league compared to other european leagues and you know i'm not saying what's right or wrong but for example, in you know other European countries, certain nations have the fact that in your top league you have to have two homegrown players under the age of 23 on the floor at all times. So then, by default, the homegrown players become more of a necessity than your import players, and your homegrown players should be able to link better into the local community, which should then raise aspiration and it should raise interest and media coverage and. And you know, so the the our our professional league um, does does have you know carry massive weight for for increasing media coverage. And I know for a fact certain teams have you know fantastic media presence. You know, I think the Eagles, uh, Worcester, uh, Leicester, sorry, is a guy there does a great job in terms of their media presence, and that's growing. Um, so it, it's about kind of you know asking what work, what doesn't work, growing that, and then hopefully you know we get it to the point where it is. Um, you know, it's it's back on TV screens like it was a few years back on Sky, and I think that'd be that'd be important. It would go to to help it, but in, I think that's always going to be one one difference that's that's from the uh, from the US. But in terms of the media, it's you could say to a certain extent, or this is my opinion, uh, they are somewhat at fault in terms of the coverage any sport gets outside of football because it's kind of gone from or we'll say 20 years ago it'd be one live game a week to mm -hmm. you can watch football any day of the week now on television so it's yeah. a case of media is somewhat at fault because obviously they've chucked so much money at football mm -hmm. whereas if they'd maybe i don't know distributed it evenly because they, they say oh football's the most popular thing but it's 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 that you're saying that because obviously that's the people that watch it but from grassroots level and i think uh talking to other people basketball is one of those things in within in a city it's probably the more popular of any sport because <laughs> to a certain extent you 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 only need a you know you only need the ball but talking to the likes of John Amici on, uh, that, that I did on a previous podcast, he, he, he brought up the fact, obviously, it's getting dearer and dearer to rent court space. Obviously, it's not just having the ball. It's You've got to get shoes, mm -hmm. um, hire out court time. If you want to get better, you look have to look at, obviously, going from uh, not just two hours a week, you're going to have to do look at six hours a week. And it was this aspect of... He went to his his local leisure center in, in London just to to find out well how much is it going to cost to hire out the uh, the court space. So he, he asked in terms of the badminton court, oh, I want to hire out uh, free badminton courts for two hours. Mm -hmm. How much would it cost? And the, the obviously the leisure center said X amount for this, and they were kind of quite inquisitive as to why why do you want free free uh, badminton court? Oh, I want to. I want to play basketball for two hours. Oh no, it's yeah. gonna cost this it's gonna cost this much. And you're thinking, why why does it cost more to hire out for basketball when at the end of the day you're still hiring out the same um 
how would I say it? Uh, the, 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 the same space within within the leisure centre. So I don't know if it's it's something I didn't ask him on air. Was um, is it a case of um, the local authorities looking at basketball on a pedestal in terms of obviously using the America as the model? Obviously, oh, the NBA is they've got their low well the higher their high earners in terms of sports and then coming back and putting it on people within the UK where in, where in all reality it is the American the American model is probably a different beast altogether because technically in all honesty we say football is a high earner payer most that if you actually brought the American sports into into that that um, uh, context, the football has done in anything compared to say, uh, I think the highest earners are actually in baseball. You're thinking so, yeah. And majority of that, in all honesty, they don't play. They're not playing for a lot of the time. Be it uh, okay defensively, they'll be out in the field, but you. you it, in all reality, you've obviously got those three out. So, in that order, well, maybe on average, say five, six players might be at bat at one time. So, not all the players are playing, and they're on exorbitant amounts of money. So, mm-hmm. kind of coming back to that point, it's the obviously the local authorities aren't helping to progress a sport mm-hmm. that is. Probably at grassroots, probably one of the, if not the most popular. So it's kind of not helping itself to be able to facil- facilitate people to progress on that route if if they perceive a uh, future within that sport. Yeah, funding is a funding is a you know like like you've touched on is a whole other. Um, Hold the can of worms, you know it is. It's it's, and, but it's critical, you know, in in any sport, but particularly in basketball. You know, you look at, I mean, participation rates. You you touched on you you, you said kind of like you know the accessibility for inner city kids, James. You know, it is. It, it's a sport that because of the nature of the sport and and I guess some of the the culture that surrounds the sport and it, it it's you know it, it can attract people from such a diverse and such a you know, a wide background and, and, you know, there's been beyond however many case studies of, of people that, you know, basketball has been such a positive vessel. I mean, I know, for, you know, for example, uh, there was a player, I won't, you know, I don't want to mention the player's name, but, he, he you know, he'd had serious academic, he was an uh, inner city kid in London, had serious academic issues, you know, uh, on the border of being expelled. He went on to be one of our best national team players because of somebody who worked with him, helped him harness his 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 his, uh, his skills, his you know his his athletic ability, his uh, his mindset, his temperament, and 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 yet he went on to captain our national team, um, and it, that's just one example of how many there are because of the sport. So I mean, the sport itself has, um, it, you know, it, because of the nature of it, the dynamics, that all that type of stuff. It is it 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 should be one of the most accessible. You know, like you said, John Amici and other, you know, that it is right that uh, there's 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 funding barriers there. I mean, I was lucky when I was when I was of a younger age. My local, I wrote a letter, and I, I, honestly, I've got a box of stuff like memorabilia stuff that I keep. And I remember I wrote a letter uh, at school to my local MP asking whether I could use facility hire for free because it was only local court. Um, and he actually wrote back, and he wrote to the local council on my behalf. And I think he didn't get it free, but it was something like I had to pay a token fee of maybe two pound an hour or something um, for me to go in and work out. And you know, like you say, that it goes back to the level of level of coaching, level of organisation. An under fourteens player over here that needs to, if you look at like long term athlete devol- uh, development and like uh, the ten thousand hours model that you know Dr. Isfan Barley came up with, and all this stuff that other sports have now interpreted. Uh, if you start at about eleven years old. And you go up to twenty one, and the, the ten thousand hours works out roughly at about eighteen and a half to twenty hours somewhere in that region. 
a week, you know, for the long term athletic development. Which eleven and a half year old is you know is going to be competing for eighteen hours a week, you know, and and, and that can be holistic development, I guess. So it's you know technical sessions, tactical sessions, games, but eighteen hours a week to that age over ten, and this, you know the ten thousand hour model is for podium athletes to be able to go and you know to compete at the best of their ability. So to do that, funding and accessibility is key, and we don't have it. Linked into to the states, I and mean, one of the best things when I was out there, the the, the coach gave me a set of keys to the gym, mm -hmm. so I could go in at any time of day, any time of night, and play. Over here, that doesn't happen. Um, there's just you know that many examples of people that are able to not only just go and progress, get to the elite level, but people that are going to learn, you know, learn fantastic life skills and be like you know functioning members of our society positively do you know what i mean like and, and like you said in the city stuff you know the difference of going in and accessing a basketball session or going out and doing things that they shouldn't be doing it, like it, it is it, it, it's crazy um in terms of the, the the money you know the the last funding cycle from sport england which obviously is big on 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 funding um uh, kind of participation and then that funding goes into governing bodies usually they obviously reduced uh, funding that was paid directly to Basketball England and, and increased funding to a company called Reach and Teach um, which is a, you know, a London based company because they had a really positive track record of participation and throughout their programme you know, proving that uh, they had sustained participation I think it was over a minimum of six week period don't quote me on it but I think it was over a minimum of six week period um, because they'd had a track record of participation and growing the game and their athletes then moving on. Um, obviously, last cycle of UK sport funding, you know, basketball received zero uh, because of, you, you know, I guess based on previous uh, performances and, you know, from a UK sport thing, can we invest in individual sports that have higher medal percent, you know, medal potential or can we invest in team sports? Um, and, and obviously with kind of London 2012 um, and, and, and the money that was spent on the build up to that and, um, and and the fact that how a lot of people would suggest that we underperformed um, you know that's had a massive impact on it as well so funding is is key and you know the, the there are very few centres nationally very few places where anybody can go and access basketball and not only just a kid going in but then the next thing is coaching, you know, the, the, the coaching structure that we have and the, the, the people that have access to um, access to, to young people and can help influence them and shape them and mould them and develop them. It's, it's, it's not at the required level, it's not. Um, and you get people that don't know how to coach, haven't been, uh, don't have the right experience, don't have the right qualifications, they end up becoming really key stakeholders and young people and, and it's just a, a never-ending cycle so funding for access to facilities and funding funding for coaching is just is just critical to grow the game um and, and at the minute it doesn't look like that's you know moving positively it doesn't and there's something you touched upon obviously with uh your experiences obviously of playing in in the u.s in terms of uh, the coach giving you a set of keys to practice whenever you can it's kind of, I think John Amici touched upon it a little bit in the podcast I did with him. And it's, it's, he was saying, uh, obviously, not just in the US, but in Europe, they focus on those fundamental skills and they're able to do it, say, shoot a 18 footer with their eyes closed. Whereas I don't know, and obviously, being a, a, a we'll use the, the point guard as the example. Obviously, having the handles to be able to look up and see the bigger picture. Mm. Do you, do you think it's something in the UK that we focus too much on uh, the aesthetics of basketball? Obviously, the show, the showboating aspect of it in terms of obviously dunks. Um, trying to oh this is the word I'm trying, like crossovers yeah. and that, and yeah. trying to put the person on their ass in terms of instead of doing yeah. the fundamentals properly yeah. if, yes in some sense uh i think kids are I, listen 
again, it goes back to the coaching. It does. You know, it really goes back to, to, to what is effective coaching and people having the right experience and the right qualifications to coach young individuals. It does. If you let's let's go and pick a random junior game this weekend. Let's go and watch it. And ninety percent of the game is going to be layups or three points. Like you know, it's going to be head down, fast break. I'm going to go and score a layup quickly. You know, is there going to be? And listen, I'm talking stereotypically here because there are a lot of good people in good programs that are trying to change it. Um, but there are also a lot of people who aren't. And unless we get on board with a national system that uh, people be held accountable in this national system, it's not going to change. Um, as I you know, say, junior basketball, right? I've got the biggest kid in the gym who is, I don't know, six six, six seven, but potentially has had a faster, faster maturation rate. So he's you know, maybe he's 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 done growing and and that's it now. Okay, well we're gonna go and stick him at the basket and he's a five man for us, particularly like under fourteens level, six foot four kid, under fourteens. Okay, well he's gonna go and play the five. That's all we're gonna teach him, that's all we're gonna because he's gonna help us win now. And at the end of this under fourteen season, as a coach, I'm gonna go and get a professional job. No chance, you know, it's just not gonna happen. But we're gonna help that that's what's gonna help them win now. Okay, well, that same six foot four person is six foot four at the age of nineteen. He now has to play against two and three men, and he hasn't got the skill set to do it, so he's dropped out of the game, or he hasn't been coached appropriately. Um, the the showboat in front, you know, stuff that you were talking about. Yes, I think that can be a part of it, uh, but again, I think that links back into to coaching and you know highlight plays and so on. It, it's probably again, you know, the the emergence of of, of hoops fix. Um, you know, over the past seven years, Sam does a tremendous job at, at growing the game and growing interest in the game, and the amount of hours he's put in. Uh, you know, I've, I've actually, I, I, when he did his hoops fix all star game, I coached one of the games, and uh, you know, I have a ton of respect and time for him um, and understand it. But it's amazing again the amount of kids that talk about you know trying to get on hoops fix, and that's not going to be with a with a jump stop and up and under. You know, it's going to be with a with a highlight play that he can put on his website. Again, I'm not bad mouth I'm not because he's went and done something that was missing and he's done it off his own back and he is the other side of it that maybe people don't see behind the scenes is his you know, his his links into like parliament groups and all that type of stuff where he's really kind of done a lot of you know, a lot of work on that side. But I think Hoopfix is great because it gives kids that outlet and it, it really mm-hmm. it increases coverage. Um but then again, if a coach isn't does not have enough understanding, or you know, isn't qualified enough, because qualifications are key too. However, you know, we, we have to. A friend of mine and guy who's a tremendous coach, I mentioned it before, James Veer. Um, you know, he spent time in Canada, and he was talking to me about their development system for coaches in Canada and how long it takes for coaches to actually be appropriately qualified at level two and at level three. Over here, you can get your level two qualification, which means I can go off and head coach in four days, you know, and, and, and I can go and do that in four days. And now I'm entrusted to go and be a head coach of an under 15s uh, national league team, under 16s. What? And it just it makes it makes no sense because the, you get the people who do that are, you know, whether it's a player's parent who is super invested great they should be a volunteer they're people that we need in the sport but you have to train them appropriately and you have to mentor them appropriately because then they will then feed back into our kids they have direct impact with our kids and you know you like the showboat in the fundamentals the, the being able to jump stop being able to pass off both hands it just it, it, it should improve and I know there are, you know, I'm not gonna. There are certain people and certain coaches that do that effectively, and they're the coaches that I try and work with to recruit their athletes into Northumbria, um, from 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 a personal standpoint. But there are a lot of coaches out there that don't do that, um, and and don't kind of, you know, they're very short term, short term thinking. There's there's another player who I know. Um, I was lucky enough to when I when I first started, uh, I was kind of a, a volunteer assistant coach for the England under sixteen team, um, and it was the the ninety three born generation. So they were the first generation to win promotion out of Division B to Division A with like Devon Van Oostrum, Joe Hart, yeah. um, and these types of players. And there was a player who who was on that team who was six foot 
and he was being played as a three slash four for his club as six foot because he was he was lightning quick. We could put him on a wing and he could go and score, and that was it. Well, he, the, the kid six foot. He's never you know he needs to learn how to be a point guard, how to be a two guard, and I know that he's spent most of, and he's, he's he's somebody who I, who I worked with a lot after that tournament, and it, it's about you know. He's done a tremendous job, but to be fair to him, to give him the best possible chance, that should have been something that was happening at the age of 13, at the age of 14. And, and you know, why specify him in a position at that age when, like, there's so many factors onto how he's going to, mm. how he's going to develop, how he's going to grow. And there's just, ultimately for me, it's, you know, the, st the stuff that you mentioned, it's, um, it, it, it's coaching. And I, I've been, I was, you know, I was privileged where, our governing body did. Uh, I was nominated to do the FIBA Europe coaching certificate, which was a it was a three year, a three year qualification through FIBA, um, and I was with sixty seven coaches uh, from all of the governing bodies and federations. And there was uh, another English coach, Steve Bucknell, who obviously you know tr uh, first English guy to play in the NBA. He was another English coach on the course with me, and it was amazing to get an insight into their. Um, you know their workings. You know Belgium, Latvia, Lithuania, Spain, uh, Portugal, all all these you know different nations, basketball nations, and just to talk with them about things that their governing bodies do, things that their clubs do, things that their national systems do, and you know to to understand how as a nation we can catch up and learn from them. And a lot of it, the majority of it, comes down to access to facilities. Of course, of course, that's key, um, and having specific use centres for basketball, not where, well, I can get a basketball session in or I can sell it to badminton, for, you know what I mean? Or for, that, that's key. But the ultimate one for me was coaching. 100% it was coaching um, and coach education and coach development. And that's something that, that they need to improve. And then in terms of coaching, uh, it's one I brought up previously in other podcasts. Uh, what is your take on say for example uh making how do i say it? from from an offensive standpoint this this notion of uh players or coaches wanting everybody to have a piece of the pie instead of looking at for example from a defensive aspect of the game you're trying to make the team go away from plan a Mm -hmm. What's what's your what's your take on coaches and players that are oh, I I'm not I'm not getting the ball today and kind of moan about it when at the end of the day offensively if the system is working you don't know you you would have thought you would not go away from it. They won't play in Northumbria. <laughs> it's the simplest form. They won't. Um, it's a team sport. You wanna you wanna take more shots, be a better shooter. Do, do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like for it's it's a, it's a team sport where people have to buy into team concepts. Um, so just linking it, and, and you know, I'm not saying that we we get things right, we get things wrong. Of course we do uh, as a club, but I am proud of the way that our club approaches the game, and um, you know, I have I have philosophy on it, and and the culture and the environment is key to those things. Um, you know, and addressing offensive and defensively, we've always tried to. Um, it, it's the utopia for us as a club. It doesn't happen. Is we want to get six guys in double figures um, where possible. Um, and when we've had success over a course of the season and in different situations, we've done that. We've just played a game today, and we've had five guys in double figures, so we just fell short. Um, but it, I mean, I'm, I'm not. I'm not saying that's the right thing. I'm just saying it's a nice target. That would mm. it help em emphasize and reinforce like team basketball and team play uh, on the defensive end? For me, there are non-negotiables. You know, a non-negotiable -nego is everyone has to guard. You know, and you have to guard a certain way. And exactly what you said about you know taking away the opposition's kind of primary strength on an individual basis or a team basis. Uh, we put a lot of time into our scouting. So the first maybe six to 10 weeks of the season we're really focused on ourselves and what our principles are and embedding them and instilling them and then after that we try and stay true to our principles but on a week-to-week -week basis you know there's a certain player that likes to 
shoot the ball from three? How can we guard that player? There's a certain player that likes to go left hand more than right hand in pick and roll. Can we can we do that? And these you know, and that's a little stuff where for me there are non negotiables, you know, that, that is critical to the game and, and defensively, um, that has its role and it has its purpose for everybody. And I don't care what you say, that there are different level of defenders. But when you're out there with four of the guys and you're a defensive, you know, you, you, you put a lot of emphasis on the defensive end, everybody should be able to compete and everybody should be able to play. They should. And if they can't, then, you know, again, coaches maybe have to hold players accountable. Um, sometimes coaches, they think holding players are accountable or screaming and shouting and, you know, this kind of really authoritative. And Sometimes holding somebody accountable can be having a conversation. That player's just went to the middle and he's not meant to go middle. You know, it's something as simple as that and what's wrong with this situation. Offensively, um, you know, that's something where each coach will tell you, again, kind of, you know, how they think the game should be played. But, uh, you know, our system is based on ball movement. It's based on trying to get players who are effective in certain situations, get them the ball in those situations. Um, we really, because practice time throughout the season for us becomes challenging, uh, we're in the middle of today. We've just finished our eighth game in 15 days, which is just it's just crazy. Uh, it's absolutely crazy. So um, practice time in terms of getting practice intense and competing is it, it's very challenging at the minute. So you know a lot of practice time is very breakdown, tactical, and, and, and walkthrough based stuff. So you know if we if we run a certain we we have a basic offensive system. Um, I can't give you the ins and outs too now uh, but no, we have a basic offensive system that a lot of people you know, different people have their own system and, and certain traits but we try and break down that system and you're going to get looks from here you're going to get looks from here and it is kind of, you know, it's a system where I, it's a framework for players to play within um, linking it back into kind of what I believe is right in junior basketball so many players and clubs would teach guys to play a system uh, I actually was having a conversation with a player of mine yesterday on this, um, and a club that he came from was a you know the tremendous club for producing junior players, and they used to run a specific offensive system that was based around different types of screens and cuts, and that club felt that that was the best way to teach players to read the game. Some drawbacks on it would be that they would only know how to play that system. You know, they only, and then when they go to different systems, it takes a while. Um, so I want, you know, I want junior players to be able to know. Okay, well, this is a a flare screen, and they're chasing. So what do I do? This is a a pin down screen, and they're switching. What do I do? Because you know, and that's the most important thing for me. So the, the the system that we have is a framework for players to play within, and you know, the amount of times, like you know, I I'll just you know, even the word play, you, you know, sometimes guys catch it in the post and what do I, well, I want you to play, you know, I want you to, you, okay, so you've got to the middle and you've drew a double team, there's someone's open, there's a solution there, let's, how do we find that solution? And that's, you, you know, I, I, I don't try and overcomplicate it, we try and keep it as very straightforward as we can and it's simplest form, it's, a, it's an invasion game, isn't it? It's an advantage game that's trying to, you're trying to get the best available shot. Um and that's something that we, we don't get right all the time, of course we don't, and that's the beauty of basketball, you know, the fact that you can always improve and you can always, um, but that that is what we're trying to do, <laughs> whether it looks like that or not sometimes, who knows, uh, but that's what we're trying to do. Okay, so I think we'll wrap it up there, Mark, so thanks again for, for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, thanks for having me, I really appreciate it, I do, and uh, keep up the good work. Thank you very much. And before I forget, I would really appreciate it if you would be so kind as to leave a short written review as it helps to get the podcast more notoriety and it will be more visible in future to others and thus helping more people, which my guests and I are all about. Once again, thanks for listening and I'll catch you next time for another episode of the Mindset Game Podcast. Thank <laughs> you.